Really what we're talking about is the relationship between information and energy, and in fact we're talking about the relationship between information and entropy. So just let me stress, if you're thinking of getting all of thermodynamics in the next five minutes, it, it's not going to happen. So we're going to focus on this one, one idea which has really fascinated physicists for, oh, well, oh, let's say since around about 1860, and it comes up time and time and time again, which is the relationship between heat and energy, entropy, and in particular, information. We're going to think of it in terms of bits of information, because you could have a very complex thought, you could have a very, as you say, fleeting thought, you could have a snapshot, I don't know, you could see a, an image appear in front of you and it's gone the next minute, and we could think about that image in terms of the number of bits of information. Now, I'd love to be able to say that our knowledge of the brain is such that we can understand those thought formation processes, as we're nowhere near understanding just how that happens, but we can Think about it in terms of bits of information, and that's, that's really where I'm going with this. I've got to stress as well that there has been a, a couple of videos, and there's quite a lot of discussion online, which is actually one of the reasons we're doing this video, about, you know, for example, how much does the internet weigh? And that was a video that, oh, I believe Vsauce did a number of years ago. This is a different concept, a very different concept, because what Michael, what Vsauce did was, was basically think about electron, electrons, the mass of the electrons, charge, and how much charge, electronic charge, you need to store bits of information. What we're going to talk about is much more fundamental, much more subtle, much more conceptually challenging, and therefore I would argue much more fun. I'm going to start with, as it says here, one of the most heavily quoted passages in physics. And this is from Maxwell, and it's back in the 1860s. And he's talking about something which is uh, known as the Maxwell's demon. Here's our demon. We'll get back to our demon soon on. Let's lift our veil. If we conceive a being whose faculties are so sharpened that he can follow every molecule in its course, such a being, whose attributes are still as essentially finite as our own, would be able to do what is at present impossible to us. And I'm going to explain what, exactly what that means. The original version of the Maxwell's demon, we've got molecules moving around in a box. So they've got some energy, and that energy is coming from the, just the heat energy from the environment. We have a partition in the box. And so, what we're going to do now is the demon, and here's our demon, is going to follow the trajectories of the molecules. And what she's going to do is, if she has a fast-going molecule which is moving in this direction, she's going to open the thing, open the, the partition, open the, the gate, and let it through. Only the fast ones. What we're doing here is we're dividing up the fast and the slow molecules. Let's say this one, for example, is zipping around. So it's coming towards the, the, the gate. She sees that this one's zipping around and it's going very fast, much faster than the average, so she lets it through. This one's moving more slowly, so this one doesn't get through. And on this side, okay, it's the opposite way around. So what's happening is that she's going to let the slow moving ones through. So if this is quite slow approaching here, this one goes through, whereas the fast one she keeps on this side. So over time, what happens, of course, is that we end up with all the molecules over here. These are all the speed demons that have made it through. And on this side, you end up with the slow coaches. Now, what's wrong with that? There's an awful lot wrong with that, because what we've done is we've generated a temperature difference without putting any work in. Because when this, um, we assume, and Maxwell uh, made the assumption, that when you lift this partition, this is frictionless, and you can just lift this without doing any work. So it's all entirely smooth, and this can come up without doing any work. And the demon wasn't doing any work. What we've done is we've broken the second law of thermodynamics, because over here, We've, we've sorted the molecules in well, we've sorted the molecules in both partitions in terms of their speeds. Second law of thermodynamics tells us that really what, what this what wants to happen is you randomize. The even simpler version of this, which is a, another type of demon, you don't even think about the speeds. What you're going to do is if it's approaching this way, um, you let it through, 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 and what you end up with is a pressure difference, a major pressure difference. And now, here's another problem, because now we have a pressure difference. In principle, that pressure difference can do work. And yet, the way an engine works is we have a temperature gradient. Here, we have no temperature gradient. Remember, this is just coupled to one big temperature bath outside. We've designed a gradient, or we've managed to put a gradient in the system without effectively doing any work. And now we can get work out. We're getting a free deal. We're getting a, you know, we're getting a free lunch. And that is a major problem. And this caused so many um, 
headaches and still, in some regards, causes headaches. Well, uh, Phil, why does it cause headaches when it's a thought experiment with a demon that doesn't exist and is not possible? That's a very, that's very good... That's saying if a unicorn walked in, that would be confusing, but a unicorn can't walk uh, in. No, that's a very good point, but the, the, the history of physics and the history of philosophy is riddled with Gedanken experiments. So you think about quantum mechanics, you think about relativity, those Gedanken, those thought experiments are very, very important. And you can just dismiss this and say, oh, this is never going to happen. In fact, you can never have a purely um, you know, frictionless, any type of frictionless system. Uh, there are many issues here in terms of setting this up experimentally, although it has been set up experimentally, or a version of it has recently been set up experimentally. But those Gedanken experiments are really important because they drive your thinking in one particular way. And the thing is, you've got to stand back from this and go, well, there's a problem here, so where, where is the problem? And ultimately, and it took a long time and a lot of debates and a lot of controversy, it's the information that's stored by the demon that's, that's, that's the key thing. That means that there's a direct link between information, and as we can see, we've set up a pressure difference here, or we can set up a temperature gradient, as we, as we saw in terms of the molecules, which means there's a direct link, in, um, link between what this demon knows and what's going on physically. And we've got to think about what the energy cost of the information of what this demon knows. That's the key thing, is what's the energy cost? And I'm afraid, really, it's not just the energy cost. It's actually we've got to think about entropy. And so let's have a really, we've tried entropy a number of times before in 60 symbols. Well, let's have a really simple explanation of entropy. Here's a low entropy state. All the molecules on that side of the box. That's a very low entropy state. That's not good. You know what's going to happen is if you've got some milk on the top of your coffee, you put a droplet of cream or whatever, or milk on the top of your coffee, it spreads out. It diffuses. This is a, a low entropy state. That's not a natural state of affairs, particularly when you've got thermal energy pouring in. What's going to happen is that they're going to randomize. That's a high entropy state. Now, here's a very interesting aspect of this. If we've got all our molecules on there, and we put a partition in, bingo, we're very, very happy because those molecules can knock this partition out and we can, we can extract work. If, however, we've got a high entropy state and we whack our partition in the middle, or, or valve, this is just going to go bounce back and forth and it's not going to go anywhere. That's a key difference between a high and a low entropy state in terms of the amount of work we can generate. And there's um, a guy called Sillyard who is really famous because he came up with nuclear chain reactions. He was fascinated by Maxwell's demon, and like a very good physicist, like all good physicists do, he, th he went down the spherical cow route, think, right, let's simplify this. What's the simplest possible thing we can have? One molecule. Let's make it even simpler. Let's not let it move in three dimensions or two dimensions. Let's just make it move in one dimension. And what's very interesting now is that you can imagine having a piston. Let's change this to a piston now. Right, so now what we have is a piston. And we've got this molecule in the box. Here's, here's the key thing. If we don't know the position of the molecule in the box, so it's bouncing around, what it'll do is it'll keep thumping off that, thumping off that, moving the, the, the piston forward as long as the piston doesn't fall over. Yeah. Or it could be in this side of the box. And it'll drive it back. But if we have no idea where the position of the ball is, on, on average, it's going to move that way and it's going to move that way. If, and this is, this is Celio's key insight, if, however, we bring our demon back in, who's now a slightly stupider demon, in fact, she doesn't really have to do anything um, other than say what side, or work out which side of the box the particle's on, the molecule is on, doesn't have to worry about the velocity of the molecule, and indeed, there's one of them, so I think even I could probably handle one molecule. Let's say... The, the molecules here at one instance of time. Now, if the demon knows that, what she can do, and sh she can insert this piston on either side of the box. That's important. She can insert the piston on either side of the box. She has to make a decision. If the molecule's over here, then she knows she can insert the piston here. And here's the key thing. Remember, this is frictionless. There's no molecules here. There's only one molecule. No work, no work, no work, no work, no work. Comes up here. A molecule starts bouncing back and starts pushing it back. You're extracting work for... You know, again, you're getting a free lunch. But it all relies on the information here. It all relies. If we don't know which side of the box the molecule is on, we're not going to be able to extract this work reliably.
reliable. We can extract it. Just on Tuesdays we can, but on Thursdays we won't. But the problem is if we don't know which side it's on, it's as likely to go that way as it is to go that way. So, and that's in terms and of... still extracting work, just in a different direction. No, but the important thing is, very good point, Brady, but the important thing is, let's say the ball's here, the molecule's here. If we now start pushing this piston forward, it, it, we've got an issue because the, um, the molecule is, is acting against the piston as well. So we're not getting this free lunch anymore. So it's the important, the key aspect of this is knowing which side of the container the molecule is actually on. And of course, it's 60 symbols, I'm simplifying, before the comments section starts filling up, I'm simplifying this a great deal. Yeah, let me cut to the chase. There's this clear link between entropy and information and knowledge of the system. In fact, many now will uh, couch entropy or explain entropy in terms of missing information. And indeed, there's a whole area of entropy, which is different from, got to stress that, but related to thermodynamics and thermal processes in communication and computers and information technology and everything around us. There's something called Shannon entropy as well. Again, these incredibly close links with, with information. I did say I'd cut to the chase. So how does that connect with thoughts? Very clever guy who, called Landauer, who back in the 60s was again thinking of this problem. And he worked out precisely the energy associated with one bit of information from this model, from this type of model. Because here we've got one bit of information, which is which side of the box is the particle on? That's our bit of information. Is it on the left or is it on the right? That's, that's our one bit of information. And from the thermodynamics of this model, you can connect that bit of information to the, uh, to the, the energy. And so if we work that out, go on, let me write one equation on the board, just one. There we go. And let's put it energy, and we'll say one bit. This is something called Boltzmann's constant, right? Boltzmann's constant is a pretty small number. All you need to worry about is Boltzmann's constant is the conversion factor is like, it's like having two different currencies and you're converting between them. This is the, the um, conversion rate. Um, and what it does is it converts from temperature to energy. Units are really, really important for physicists. This doesn't have units, so this has got to have units energy. K translates temperature to energy. That's, that's the formula, and it's really straightforward for one bit of information. Now, if we work that out, at, in terms of what we have at room temperature, say, turns out that that is something like 3 by 10 to the minus 21 joules. That's the energy associated with one bit of information. Got me Mars bar for lunch. If we look in the back here, though my eyesight's getting really bad, really might have to help out. So if we work in proper units, like physicists do, which are joules, not this calorie nonsense, we find that it's actually nearly a megajoule. It's 960 kilojoules. So that's 960 by 10 to the 3. This is, we're going to do the equal sign, is 3 by 10 to the minus 21 joules. The amount of energy you get from this, E Mars bar, is about one megajoule, which is one by 10 to the six joules. You can see that there are an awful lot of those in one of those, a huge, huge amount in one of those. So then we come to the really tricky question, which a physicist is really not equipped to address, which is what is a thought? Um, so for me, for, as a physicist, thought's just information. Let's say we're going to assume, I don't know, maybe you think in pictures like I do. So let's say this picture that you're currently looking at, that's 1920 by 1080 pixels. And we're going to assume that each pixel is 24 bits of information. Put those numbers together, multiply them up, and we find that what we get is that that's for that lovely image you just saw, if I can get the board to move, number of bits of information is about, I'll do a about sign, 50 by 10 to the 6. 50 million. Now we know from there that the energy for one bit is 3 by 10 to the minus 21. So what we're going to do, the energy of our thought is going to be 3 by 10 to the minus 21 multiplied by 50 by 10 to the 6. Work that through, that's 150 by 10 to the minus 15, 
which is equal to 1.5 by 10 to the minus 13. And I hope you're screaming at me, what are the units? The units are joules. So, how much of a Mars bar is that amount of energy? So we've already told you that the energy of a Mars bar, in terms of the nutritional energy that we've read up here, is about a, a megajoule. So let's put energy Mars bar is about one megajoule. So this is its chemical. This is the energy you get from it if you, you eat it. So let's, let's look at what that, that's going to, we can work out what fraction of the Mars bar in terms of the, the, the energy you get from eating it um, is associated with a thought. And it turns out, well, as you can see, it's going to be a really, really small number. If we put the energy of our thought over the energy of our Mars bar, that's this incredibly small number divided by this rather large number, which is 10 to the 6th, which is about 1.5 by 10 to the minus 19. So this is just a ratio. So it means that the energy associated with your thought is about uh, 10 million, million, million times smaller than the energy you get from eating your Mars bar. If you were to eat this, it would be roughly, very, very roughly, about an atogram. You're not going to be able to see that. Um, that's a, a, an invisible quantity of, of, of Mars bar. How much I'm going to try and get, get, get that. I that, that's, I don't know, maybe that's, <laughs> that's a few that. thousand thoughts just for you, no, really. No. <laughs>